Hello there. Welcome to Advancing Adventism. Or if you've been here before, welcome back. Now, if you're an SDA, you've probably heard of the 1888 message, and you know that it's referred to as justification by faith or righteousness by faith. And you might even know that there was a whole lot of controversy over the message when it was first presented at the General Conference session in the fall of 1888. But, you know, a lot of SDAs haven't necessarily delved very deeply into what the message was about. And so, you know, there still might be a lot of uncertainty as to the core of the 1888 message. So in this video, we're going to make it very simple. And by the end, you should walk away with just a very clear idea of what the core of the 1888 message is. Now, here are the three 1888 messengers, E.J. Wagner, A.T. Jones, and Ellen White. And a lot of SDAs might not think of including Ellen White as one of the 1888 messengers. But we can see from statements that she made herself that she had been teaching this same message as well as Wagner and Jones. She says here, Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. This was not new light to me, for it had come to me from higher authority for the last 44 years. Of course, this was written in 1888, so that takes you back to 1844. And she says, and I had presented it to our people by pen and voice in the testimonies of his spirit. So there we see from her that she was teaching justification by faith. And here's also a brief statement from her grandson, Arthur White, in his biography of Ellen White, where he's talking about the history related to um, what followed after the 1888 General Conference. And he said, It was now clear that those whose hearts were fired with the light revived at Minneapolis. And of course, Minneapolis is where the General Conference was held that year. Okay. So he says, uh, those whose hearts were fired with the light revived at Minneapolis would have to work around the prejudice of some of the leaders who had long resided in Battle Creek and take the message to the churches and take it to the churches Ellen White and A.T. Jones did. So there we see Arthur White also including Ellen White as one of the 1888 messengers. Now, Ellen White and E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones uh, wrote and spoke a lot about the message of justification by faith in the years following 1888, and um, they were all teaching the same thing as we're about to see from the quotes we're going to cover. Now, we'll start with this statement from Ellen White, and in this short statement, she provides, in a nutshell, what the 1888 message is. Okay. Now she starts off by saying, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Okay, so for a moment, we're just going to focus in on the darker text. And as you can see, the 1888 message is about justification through faith. And there's a whole lot to say about justification by faith. And we'll talk about more of those aspects in other videos on this channel. But in this video, we're doing something very specific. We are just focusing in on what the 1888 message teaches about what justification is. OK, so the first thing to take note of from Ellen White's statement is that this darker section, um, she's basically saying things, the same sort of thing in two different ways. First, she says the 1888 message presented justification through faith in the surety. And then notice in the second clause, it starts to explain a little bit more about what justification is. She says, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ. So this second clause basically says the same thing as the first clause, but it's starting to explain now what it means to be justified. 
Okay, namely, it means to receive the righteousness of Christ. Now, that's a significant point to take note of. It's not about the righteousness of Christ being applied to someone's account or, you know, applied to the record books or anything like that. It's about the people as individuals receiving the righteousness of Christ, receiving justification. Now, and what does it look like to receive the righteousness of Christ? This last clause now in the blue explains that. She says, receiving the righteousness of Christ is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. So again, it isn't just about something being done in theory, right? As we'll see throughout the rest of this video, receiving justification is something very practical. It's not something theoretical. Now, in these statements, notice what she says there at the top, what Ellen White says, through his grace, they are justified, made righteous, and every soul to whom Christ has imparted his righteousness is under solemn obligation to practice that righteousness. Now, notice what she says about being justified. She says being justified is to be made righteous. Again, notice it's not about something uh, or someone being declared righteous. It's being made righteous. Now, often people um, think that justification is when God declares one to be righteous, and sanctification is being made righteous, right? But that's not what she's saying here. She's saying justification is being made righteous. It's also having the righteousness of Christ imparted to us. Now, here again, uh, this isn't just about being considered righteous. It's about receiving righteousness in practical reality. Now, we can see that this is really in practical reality because uh, it's not something optional. It's obligatory, right? We're under solemn obligation to do something, to practice that righteousness. Now, just to make this super clear, when she says uh, to be justified is to be made righteous, righteousness isn't like a special glow of holiness or anything like that. It's actually uh, right doing. She says righteousness is right doing and it is by their deeds that all will be judged, okay? Now, lastly, it's really, really clear that she's talking about actually being changed into a right doer because she says his or Christ's righteousness is only imputed to the obedient. Now, this shows that Ellen White rejected the idea that being justified is a mere declaration that someone is now righteous, right? Uh, when it doesn't actually reflect the reality of a person's actions. She makes that very clear when she says his righteousness is only imputed to the obedient. So it's about their actual behavior. Now, here's a statement from A.T. Jones. He says, let it be borne in mind and upon the heart forever by every soul that justification being made righteous by faith of Jesus Christ means, so he's going to tell us what justification means, right? Justification by faith of Jesus Christ means in itself, in every sentiment of it, the total abandonment of sins and the destruction of the body of sin in order that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, this is a very, very straightforward, positive declaration of what justification is and what it looks like. Justification is being made righteous, just like what Ellen White said. And justification by faith of Jesus Christ means the total abandonment of sins. Again, not a declaration that now you've abandoned sin, even if you haven't actually abandoned sin. Because from henceforth, we should not serve sin, right? That's what he's saying. It means to be justified. 
Now, here's a statement from E.J. Wagner. He's saying the same thing as Ellen and A.T. Jones. He says, to justify means to make righteous or to show one to be righteous. Now, it is evident that perfect obedience to a perfectly righteous law would constitute one a righteous person. It was God's design that such obedience should be rendered to the law by all his creatures, and in this way the law was ordained unto life. Now, again, E.J. Wagner also is describing justification as being made righteous, and he says perfect obedience to a perfectly righteous law would constitute one a righteous person. That's what would constitute one a righteous person, right? So, here again, we see that this isn't just about being described as like a theoretical idea that a person stops sinning. It's about what the person actually does. Is the person actually obedient or not? Now, here's another statement from E.J. Wagner. And in this, it's even more plain. He says, and it, I'll just say this was something he said to the SDAs uh, gathered at the General Conference of 1891. So just a few years later, three years later, right? Well, two and a half, uh, because this was in the spring of 1891. He's speaking to the SDA people there and he says, but in all our Christian experience, we have left little loopholes along here and there for sin. We have never dared to come to that place where we would believe that the Christian life should be a sinless life. We have not dared to believe it or preach it. But in that case, we cannot preach the law of God fully. Why not? Because we do not understand the power of justification by faith. Now, here again, we see one of the 1888 messengers explaining what it means to be justified. The Christian life should be a sinless life. That's the power of justification by faith. It's just like what Joan said. Um, it's the total abandonment of sins. And Ellen White said about uh, receiving Christ's righteousness is made manifest by obedience to all of God's commandments, right? So, again, this message of justification by faith is saying that when a person is justified, what that means is that there's no longer a serving of sin. Total abandonment of sins, Christian life should be a sinless life in practical reality, not in theory. Now, we're going to see um, some more statements that really overtly make it plain that this is practical, not theoretical. And we're going to start with a statement from E.J. Wagner from Christ and His Righteousness, page 65. And I'm going to make sure to have links to important resources in the description, including a link to this book. So uh, you'll be able to read it freely and all that. Um, Always keep in mind to check out the descriptions for our videos. We try to really um, provide good resources to get a person started in doing further investigation into the topics that we're covering in our videos. So again, we're going to be looking at statements that really spell out that this transformation that takes place at justification is practical. It's not theoretical. Okay, so here's what he says. And so we find that when Christ covers us with the robe of his own righteousness, he does not furnish a cloak for sin, but takes the sin away. And, you know, I, I forgot to mention that this is right after he has quoted from Zechariah chapter 3, where it's describing Joshua, the high priest, who had been filled uh, clothed with filthy garments and then had the filthy garment taken away and then was given a, a clean, a pure robe. Right. So this is what he's relating. And then he goes on to say, so we find that when Christ covers us with the robe of his own righteousness, he does not furnish a cloak for sin, but takes the sin away. OK. He then adds, and this shows that the forgiveness of sins is something more than a mere form 
something more than a mere entry in the books of record in heaven to the effect that the sin has been canceled. So it's more than all of that, right? It's not theoretical. It's more than just in theory. He says the forgiveness of sins is a rea uh, reality. So it's practical, okay? It is something tangible, something that vitally affects the individual. It actually clears him from guilt. And if he is cleared from guilt, is justified, made righteous, he has certainly undergone a radical change. Okay, so here we go. He's explaining that it's not about some, some record being applied to a person's account. You're actually cleared from guilt. And then if you're justified, if you're made righteous, you've undergone a radical change. Justification doesn't allow for sin. It doesn't furnish a cloak for the sin that remains or whatever. That's not the depiction in Zechariah 3. And it's not what the 1888 messengers were teaching about what it means to be justified. They're saying very clearly, Jesus doesn't furnish a cloak for your sin. It's way better than that. He takes the sin away and then gives us his own robe of righteousness. It actually clears us from guilt. We're justified, made righteous. We've undergone a radical change. Okay. Now here's a statement from A.T. Jones. Again, showing that justification being uh, made righteous is not theoretical. It's something practiced out in the life. He says, the Lord Jesus did not come into the world to minister to sin, but altogether to save from sin. Okay. He says, sin is the transgression of the law of 10 commandments. Okay. So we're all familiar with that definition of sin, right? Sin is the transgression of the law of 10 commandments. And as the Lord Jesus came to save men from sin, in the nature of the case, he came to save men from the transgression of that law. Right now, this quote um, extends over the next couple of slides, too. So we'll just keep that in mind. But first, before I move on, I'll just add a little bit here. Just notice here that he's saying, OK, Jesus came to save from sin. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. So if Jesus came to save us from sin and sin is the transgression of the law, that means Jesus came to save us from transgression of the law. Okay. So again, practical, right? Not theoretical. He goes on to say, therefore, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, transgressors of the law of Ten Commandments, does Christ sanction that? God forbid. Does he justify men in order that they may be free to transgress the law? God forbid. Does he save men from sin in order that they may continue in sin? God forbid. Do we believe in Jesus in order that we may continue to be sinners? God forbid. Do we seek to be justified, made righteous, by Christ? In order that we may continue to sin, God forbid, and let all the people forever say amen. So we see there, of course, he's alluding to um, Paul in Romans a lot with all of that back and forth, right? The question and the answer, God forbid. So be sure and check that out too in the uh, letter to the Romans. But here we see very plainly that A.T. Jones is saying, hey, justification does not allow for sin just doesn't permit people to keep sinning if we are actually justified. That's not how justification is made manifest. Now, here's something else from Ellen White that shows it's very practical, not theoretical. She says, no one can believe with the heart unto righteousness and obtain justification by faith while continuing the practice of those things which the word of God forbids or while neglecting any known duty. So she's saying that if we're continuing to violate God's law, do something that the word of God forbids, we can't receive justification by faith. That's not going to mesh. So it's uh, it, now if it was just a theoretical thing, it would allow for sin to be there, you know, here or there, but the 1888 messengers were saying that, no, 
it doesn't allow for any of that. We, we can't leave little loopholes along here and there for sin. It's uh, justification is a total abandonment of sins. Now, this is continuing that same uh, quote. It's going to continue over the next few slides. She, she goes on to say, genuine faith will be manifested in good works, for good works are the fruits of faith. As God works in the heart and man surrenders his will to God and cooperates with God, he works out in the life what God works in by the Holy Spirit. And there is harmony between the purposes of the heart and the practice of the life. So obviously there the statement about genuine faith will be manifest in good works is pretty obvious. Um, that's very practical. It's not just theoretical. It's not just um, uh, believing, you know, having faith despite whether or not you're manifesting that by your works. Genuine faith is manifested by works. That's what genuine faith would do. Those are just the fruits of faith. And when that happens and there's this cooperation between us and God, when we have the purpose in our heart that we want to stop sinning, the practice, what we do in our life will match that purpose. There'll, there will be harmony when we have received justification. Every sin must be renounced as the hateful thing that crucified the Lord of life and glory. And the believer must have a progressive experience by continually doing the works of Christ. It is by continual surrender of the will, by continual obedience, that the blessing of justification is retained. Now, these are really, really important statements. It really shows that this is not in theory, it's it's not just a some writing in, in the books of records, right? It's not just some entry in the books of records. Every sin must be renounced, so it doesn't allow for any sin. Sin is that hateful thing, right, that crucified Christ. And we need to be continually doing the works of Christ. We need to be continually surrendering our will. In practical reality, we need to have continual obedience in order that the blessing of justification may be retained. See, justification doesn't allow for sin. That's what she's saying here. And then the last slide in this quote, she says, those who are justified by faith must have a heart to keep the way of the Lord. Now, notice this next statement. It is an evidence that a man is not justified by faith when his works do not correspond to his profession. Now that's stated in the negative. So how do we know that we're not justified by faith? We would know that we're not justified by faith if our works don't correspond to our profession. Objectively speaking, if you do something that violates the law of God, it would be sin. All that shows is that you're not justified, right? So it's not that being justified means you can do anything and it wouldn't be considered unrighteous. Not at all. It means that you actually aren't justified if you're doing anything that violates the law. So very important distinction there to be made. So on that note, let's just briefly summarize what we've covered. All right, now the first point to take note of that we've covered is that the 1888 message is about justification by faith. Okay, point number two, according to the 1888 message, justification or to be justified means to be made righteous. Okay, and to be made righteous means to be made a right doer. Righteousness is right doing. It means to be uh, obedient to all of God's commandments. Justification is made manifest in obedience to all of God's commandments. So that's what it means to be justified. Okay, the third point to take away from what we've covered is that the 1888 message makes it very, very plain that 
justification does not allow for sin. The 1888 messengers made those, uh, those sorts of statements very, very plainly. Now, that's, in a nutshell, the core of the 1888 message. Now, while that's very solemn, and the enemy might try to tempt people to be disheartened um, because you might have thought you were justified, and maybe you now you realize that you haven't been justified. But even with that, there's no reason to be discouraged. The reality is that the 1888 message shows that justification by faith is just way better than we've thought. If you think about it, the view of justification that says it's just God declaring someone to be righteous, even though they're still sinning in the practical life, um, that is kind of like a doctor telling someone with cancer that um, they're just going to be declared free of cancer, even though they still have cancer. But the truth is that genuine justification isn't like that at all. Uh, it's actually being freed from sinning in the practical life through cooperation with God, of course. And that is truly, truly good news. That's what the 1888 message had to say about what it means to be justified. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were blessed. Um, please share the video with someone that you love and be sure and check out some of our other topics that we cover on the channel. And if you want to be notified of our new content when it's uploaded, be sure to subscribe and click the bell. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.